<clears throat> Shalom Chavrim, I'm Steve Benun, you're watching Israeli News Live, Eli Marzuli with us here today, and uh, we're going to kind of touch a little bit again um, on Nephilim. Uh, we really had a wonderful time with him and his wife there at the conference in Oregon, and uh, uh, wish we would have had more time uh, so we could have really spent some time together bouncing ideas back and forth, but it was a blessing to us, and uh, since the conference... Uh, um, there was something else, and I've shared a little bit with this with you guys already, but I want to bring Ellie Marzulli in on this as well, because Nephilim versus Reptilian isn't one and the same. Is it something different? Uh, I don't really know for sure. I kind of look at things and, and wonder about it, but Ellie, i got to say to you that it was reading in John, or not John, but in Matthew, where uh, Matthew is writing about John as he is first coming out, and it's chapter 3, uh, specifically verse 10, and I was actually reading it in the Hebrew Matthew, and the reason I did is because I like the Hebrew much better, and uh, there are some that argue that, that Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, the, although it's brought from 18 different, uh, different fragments to put it together, that this was actually written by the, the early believers and uh, excuse me, by, it was written by the Jews and not by the uh, by Matthew. Now I dispute that because I know for a fact there is no way that Jews would ever consider Yeshua to, to have anything uh, of divinity whatsoever. And Hebrew sure. Matthew is far more clear on this than the English version that we have. They look almost identical, just a few little tweaks in there, but you can see things that are just not there. But anyway. He says here, and, and uh, I'll actually read it in the Bible most people are used to, and that would be uh, KJV or NIV or whatever, but uh, says, uh, And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth, for, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And L.A., when I saw this, I could first thing that came to my mind, it, it made me think of the tares that uh, the wheat was planted while they slept, the enemy comes in, sows tares, they grow together. Yeshua said, leave them alone, let them grow together into the harvest. At the time then, the angels will come and separate the, the wheat from the tares. So, and then of course, this axe being laid to the root of the tree, John, he's already saying to the Pharisees that they're a bunch of vipers. And uh, some people are bothered by this, and I actually go that far and say that as Yeshua brought it out, because Yeshua in the Hebrew Matthew clearly says they are seed of vipers. So identifying, now that, that doesn't mean that every Jew there is, is a seed of a viper. And, I, and I'll say that 100%, that's totally not true. But there was something about the Pharisees which were of Maccabee descent because they had overtook the uh, the priesthood in, in Israel. They threw out the Zadokite priest. They were living down in Qumran with the exception of a few. We had uh, Zacharias who was in the temple at the time, Yeshua, when, his, when he was brought in for dedication. Um, so there were some priests that were there that were not, of course, Pharisees. But the Pharisees, every, every place you see, John says it. Yeshua says it, and now the axe is laid to the root of the tree, and it doesn't bring forth good fruit. In other words, if they're not bringing forth children that are truly of the lineage of Abraham, of Adam himself, then that tree's being cut down. All right, Ellie, take it away. Huh. Well, I mean, it, the, it, the whole idea of that is, is an incredibly loaded question. And then from there, it's so easy to launch into... You know what I would call the Khazarian heresy, that the Jews that were in the Middle East are all uh, from the, from the Khazars, which I don't believe there's, a, there's some of them were there. But as I, I I talked to Dan Gordon about this years ago, and I asked him, I said, you know, what do you how do you deal with this? And he basically said that after the diaspora or after AD 70 when Titus came down, the Jews scatter out throughout throughout the Middle East, and there's been a very strong presence of Jews all through Iran, what is now, let's say, Iran, basically what was the old Ottoman Empire. They were scattered throughout that and Egypt and elsewhere. And when Israel became a state, there was this mass migration, uh, you know, back into the homeland. It, it, it gets really weird when you start looking at stuff like that, in scripture like that. But it makes you wonder, you know, what, what are we really talking about? Whose seed, what seed? Um, another, another example of this would be the serpent seed. 
which um, a, a particular Sherry Schreiner basically advocates that, that Cain, and she uses a description that we all know, you know, Cain was of the evil one. Okay, I get that. But when we go back into the into the Genesis account, we, we see that, that Adam knew his wife and she bore him a son. So it, it can't be both. It can't be, Cain can't be the serpent seed and also the seed of Adam, you know, and that's what people who adhere to the serpent seed theory. But we all know that, that Cain flips and does the unthinkable and murders his, his brother. But unlike the Nephilim, he's not given this, this judgment of eternal fire or, or gloomy dungeons or whatever. Exactly. Or wiped out in the flood. He's given a mark, but that's it. He's allowed to live. So there's, there's even, even with that, that's, to me, it's a sign of grace and mercy. Uh, that this happened. So I don't think, you know, Yeshua uh, father would, would be putting a mark on Cain if, if he in fact was a reptilian or of the seed of the serpent. So it's a very dicey question and it, it can lead to all sorts of anti-Semitism and, 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 and craziness that way. Um, what I see happening, and this gets back into Genesis 3.15, we know that the seed war is real. Okay, we know that, that the seed of the serpent will be an enmity at war with the seed of the woman. So, we also know from Daniel that their seed will mingle with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to them. Very enigmatic, sort of shrouded piece of scripture, which uh, obviously, if, if their seed will mingle with the seed of men, it can't be the seed of men will, single, will mingle with the seed of men. That makes no sense at all. So, who is they? That is, is implied in Scripture, and of course, in my opinion, that is the fallen angelic codes, which tails back to Genesis 3.15. If we don't come to grips with the Genesis 3.15 narrative, then when we get to places like Daniel, then we have no idea what's really going down. The serpent seed, um, and you know, you asked about reptilians. In my opinion, reptilians are not Nephilim. Now, this is total conjecture on my part. Reptilian may be what the true form of the fallen angel really looks like. In fact, I wrote about this years ago in the Nephilim trilogy, which was a, was a fictional work, but based on research. And in other words, Russ Dizdar taught me this name, the Greek is Metaskitsmato, Metaskitsmatosai, the ability to transform, to transmutate, to change into any form. They, they can appear as anything if they like. They can appear as male, female, anything. They can they can transmute, they can transmogrify, they can metaskits motto, they can change their shape and appear as anything that they want to, uh, which is alarming in itself. We know that from scripture that, angel, that Satan, Hasatan, can appear as an angel of light. So what is his true form? It's a dragon. His true form is a dragon. That's a reptile. So in my opinion, those who followed him took on his identity on some level. Utter conjecture on my part, I'll be the first to admit it. But people who claim to see reptilians, that's what I think they're looking at. That's their true form. That's their true form. Remember, the serpent, the dragon is cursed. A little itch in my ear here, please forgive me. But the dragon is cursed in, in the Genesis 3.15 narrative. So something's going on here. And, you know, we get we get this much of a picture, which is a lot, a lot right. bigger. Right. Now, Ellie, let me ask you this, because you kind of follow the same line that I do as well on this, because when I look at Genesis, the account there uh, with Cain, Cain is given a place to re of repentance. Uh, I mean, it's exactly in Hebrew what God comes up. If you do not, if you did as your brother, would you not be accepted? And that we can't argue that his, in his sacrifice is inferior as far as what he brought, because in Levitical law, a grain offering is also accepted before God as an offering. It is maybe the, the, the lack of quality that he brought. He didn't bring the best or he didn't bring from his heart. Uh, those could be the issues that could be attributed right there. But uh, it seems to me that whatever this reptilian race is, that has come in, it had to have come in uh, after Cain. And, uh, and, and then, of course, like you bring out, you get into, uh, you know, you go further down. We see that uh, the, daughter, the sons of God saw the daughters of man that they're fair. 
Now we know that this is speaking of how the, the fallen angels bring forth their children, and because as, as the Hebrew alludes to it, you know, and there were Nephilim in those days, it, King James calls it giants. Uh, so we know that that's what it's speaking of there. But when we jump past the flood and we look at Enoch, uh, and, and not Enoch, okay, some people get that mixed up when I say the word Enoch, A N K, Enoch. Uh, he is attributed to by Moses during the time when the spies come down. Uh, it literally says, and I'll just pull it up so I have it on my own screen here. Um, but he's actually, you know, it speaks about how that he was of the Nephilim. But there, there's something that's even a little bit more valuable in this. And I wasn't even paying attention to this. It was actually Dr. Pigeon during the conference that brought this to my attention uh, because... Dyslexic, for me, you have to understand, pic uh, words are pictures. I, I memorize the way a word looks like, not subconsciously. That's why I never could spell well, uh, because just it's just the way it looks. All right? So, But when you begin to look at this, and you go to the uh, chapter 13, the last verse, I believe it is, and that's I think that's verse 33, It's when, it's, when it writes in here, Vesham Ra'inu, which is, and, and there they, they saw Hanephilim. Nephilim is spelled He Nun Fe Yod Lamed Yod Mel. You have a Yod in there. But then it says Bene Enach from the children of Enoch. So the Nephilim, in this case here, are, are Enoch's children. But then it says he is from Mean Han Nephilim. Okay, now they use the vowel points to make it look like Nephilim again. But the Yod is not in there. So it literally shows us that Enoch himself is literally of a, as a child from one of the fallen angels itself. Which goes back to what I presented to you before when we spoke together. Sure. That you had all these sexual sins listed. And I think that's in Deuteronomy. Uh, and right in the middle of that, don't pass your children through the fire to Molech. What has that got to do with all the sexual sins? Okay, you don't have sex with your neighbor's wife. Uh, don't pass your kids to the to the fire to Molech, and then don't do another sexual sin over here on the other side. I think it's man with man, woman with woman. What's that got to do with 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 sexual sins, unless it, that passing the seed through the fire is also a sexual sin, which is clearly the way Enoch actually comes on the earth. And again, not Enoch. Yeah. Um it's very interesting, and I'm, as you know, and I swore you to secrecy on this, uh, I am working on a book on, on the second incursion, uh, second, third, multiple, fourth, fifth, sixth, into modernity, why this is happening, and why it's not the seed of Ham, in my opinion. It's just, in other words, a lot of nonsense comes through the Ham line, I get that. But Ham's wife, in my opinion, did not carry a Nephilim gene no. that infused the character of the Most High God. So we're looking at something else. And it's actually, it's been hidden in plain sight for centuries. And I don't take credit for this. This is the Spirit of the Living God, which gave me a download. And I've got my 12,000 words and growing. And I know you're, I'm going to send you a questionnaire, and you're going to write that, and you'll be part of this book, as well as uh, Steve Pigeon, uh, the, uh, the publisher of the Sefer Bible. So um, it's, it'll be, I think it'll be a very interesting book, and I think we'll, we'll state our case. And, of course, people will... Uh, flail their arms and yell and scream, but you know that's what always happens. <laughs> rather than you know, play nicely in the sandbox, look, something is going on here, and, and in my opinion, unless and I said this earlier to you, unless and to your audience, unless we understand the Genesis 3:15 narrative that the seed of the serpent is ending with the seed of the woman, that that is that that phrase that's in the Genesis narrative is so pregnant with meaning so pregnant with meaning, and it sets up the rest of the biblical prophetic narrative, in my opinion, up till the, the present day. The Antichrist doesn't go to school to become the Antichrist. In other words, it's just like he doesn't raise his hand and go, I'll do it. He is the son of perdition. Exactly. He is the offspring, the seed of the serpent himself. And this is alarming when you think about it. Very, very alarming. I got and a wild so, card for you. So, you know, in some of the angels, uh, we see that they take on different forms as far as they have different different looks. And, and, and I'm just looking at Scripture, and this is clearly a conjecture. But um, 
Uh, you have one the face of a lion, one the face of and another animal, an ox, and then of course you have the face of the man. Could it be that this reptilian race comes from the fact that one of these angels, which is Satan's beings, is as you mentioned earlier, uh, he's a dragon. He literally looked this way, and of course he introduced his own seed into this uh, in, into the realm in which we're living in, because. I mean, this is why, I mean, we have to think about it. When, when God commanded Moses and Joshua and Caleb were the only two that believed they could defeat him, to go and to destroy men, women, and children, this is not the nature of the Eternal Father to go do that unless it's not his children. Exactly. And this, this is why, I mean, here we come up to the days of Yeshua, even after all that happens, and now it's like, okay, there's one more race still sticking around, uh, you know, and and God is is saying there, you you know, Yeshua now says, let, leave them alone, just let them go, let them do their thing, you know, because why? Scripture has to be fulfilled, like He says about Judas, it had He, and that's another issue too. Yeshua says, all that the Father has given me will come to me, and none of them will be left out. I mean, there's no way around it. His are coming to Him; they won't be left out. John's talking about these reptilians, so to speak, and, and some people argue this is just spirit. Oh, it's just, it's the nature within them. Well, I agree with that too. It is the nature within them. But the problem is, is, you know, Jude says that they have, that there is, they have no hope whatsoever. I mean, how does Jude actually word that? He says, uh, uh, he likens this to those before, for there are certain men crept in unaware there's your shape shifting. They can look at any way they want, like you said, L.A. Uh, and, and then he goes on to say, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. H how do you get around that one, you know? Uh, that's just clearly there is weed and wheats, as Yeshua said. Uh, Yeshua even says this about the Pharisees at the time. How can you escape the damnation of hell? How? You know, let's add into this one here. And I know we don't, we don't want to hold you too much longer, but uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Again, it's, it's very, very complex. And, and I, would, I always look at it with a degree of caution in the sense that it, it's, if you go down that road zealously, it's one step to the Holocaust. I mean, it really is, you know, if, if you go down that road, because that's, you know, now it's the seed of the serpent. We're going to kill them all. So, I think he's looking at, and there's and there's no doubt about the mixed seed. I mean, there's no doubt. But it's a question of uh, what what he was really looking at, um, and and the Pharisees. Remember, by this time, the Babylonian Talmud is is already in shape. So they've taken everything and they've twisted it. They've taken they've taken the law. They've taken they stole the prophets. They've killed the prophets. I get all that, and no, nothing has changed today. I mean, you know, it's the same, and I'm not trying to duck out, duck out of the question, but, I mean, you can make a strong case that, um, that there's just as much persecution. When we look at what happened in the Inquisition, unbelievable. When we look at what, the, uh, what happened to the early Protestant church, the fact that Tyndall was burned at the stake. So we see this insanity that, that runs through mankind, which, you know, is uh, just... It's really so barbaric, and, and in my opinion, and Russ Dizdar would say, right, cooked up right out of Hell's Kitchen, and that's where it's from. Uh, so I, I would, I kind of take a step back and look at all this and say, yeah, the seed of a serpent is there, the, the Nephilim are there, the bones of the Nephilim are there when, when Josephus is writing. So we know, and this is complete conjecture, when Yeshua comes out of the temple, now, we know that the bones were there, so where were they displayed? We know that they can't be in the temple because they're unclean, but they could be directly outside the temple. So Yeshua comes out of the temple, and, and he's asked, you know, what, what is it going to be like when you return? He could have done something like this. He could have turned and said, it will be like the days of Noah, pointing back to the bones. Now, that's total conjecture, and I'm reading a lot into that passage, and it's a very colorful interpretation by yours truly, and I'll be the first to admit it. But it is a possibility, uh, albeit probably an extremely far-fetched one. But
but they have to be somewhere. If Josephus is writing about them, that they're openly on display, you wouldn't put them on Z Street someplace where no one would know. You'd put them in a locale where people would come to the temple and, you know, you'd have some guy going, and by the way, these are the bones of a Nephilim, which your forefathers destroyed, uh, and that's why you're here. And I believe it would have to be somewhere in the proximity of the entrance to the outer court, which would not defile the outer court, or those who would pass by them, they were sealed up. And I find that incredibly interesting. So he could have been saying, it'll be like the days of Noah when I return, pointing back to the to the huge skeletons behind his shoulder. I mean, who knows, right? All right. Just, just well, wish he had a, a, here's, a video of all this. Here's two things we can add to that, because I've, I've, I've examined the exact same thing. Uh, and when Yeshua says, as it was in the days of Noah, though, he clearly identifies what would be going on. Doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be, uh, you know, 17 foot tall anymore, because he says they would be eating and drinking and given and given in marriage, which eating and drinking, we go back to the book of Enoch, we find out that they were eating and drinking the human beings, which is going on to this day. Uh, and of course, they were also... Uh, the given and given in marriage is passing that seed through that fire and bringing back these uh, these strange children. And, and Ellie, I know you've had people approach you on this. I've been approached on this subject and with some some divinity that, that'll shock you. But I want to back up just a second, too, and just clarify as well, like yourself. You know, I'm not into anti-Semitism because I'm a Jew to begin with. My family died in the Holocaust. And even when I'm talking about what Yeshua said about the Pharisees, you have to also look that he said there were some that were believing. Even though they were Pharisees, some did believe. And we can't take away that either. And of course, Pharisees were only one sect of a religious group. We had Sadducees. We had other sects that were there as well. All right, so there are still Jews that do not believe that their eyes will open, as Paul says in the book of Romans, that they have been blinded for, the, for our sake or in the sake of the Gentiles, that is, uh, which I consider that my sake as well, because my family never believed in Yeshua all the way down for 2,000 years until Steve come along and was one of the first ones to believe in his family. So there is a remnant that comes out of all that. And whether they be Pharisee or not, I mean, I came from a long line of rabbis in my family, but uh, so it just goes to show, and Yeshua give that plumb line. He says, he said, the way you know is whether they can hear the word of God. That's the key to it. And don't hold them accountable if they don't hear it right now, because it took me 10 years to win my mother to Yeshua. 10 years, and she had to die, be raised from the dead, and everything else just to get her attention. So, yeah, I, I know that story, how that goes. So, no, it's not anti-Semitism. Uh, Ellie, if you can sum this up, though, in, in your words there, what we're looking at, uh, and, and this is fascinating to me, uh, how do you think the reptilians actually got here then? Just Even if it's conjecture completely. Well, I mean, we know, again, from the book of Enoch, that, that 200 watcher angels descend on Mount Hermon. That's very, very deliberate, and that's the essence of, of this new book I'm writing about. So I can't, I, I won't tip my hand. I can't wait till it's published, and maybe I'll keep it short and, and just keep it a very short book at maybe 14 or 15,000 or 20,000 words max and just, just get it out there, because I think the information is really important, and you know what I'm talking about. Yes, it about. is. It is important. It is important. Yeah. It's a missing link to the puzzle. I think it is. I really do. And I, again, I'm not the author of this, or the, the revealer of it. That's the spirit of a living God that revealed it to me one night, and I called up Gary Stearman, and it was 12 midnight his time, and we had an hour-long conversation about it. So I think we're on to something with this, and it's good to whet the audi audience's appetite and, and, and kind of get them you know, maybe focused on what's going to come out. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm right in the middle of a move. We're moving to Oklahoma on Monday, and it's like our life is chaotic. We're sleeping on air mattresses. So it's, it's not like I have a lot of time to, to work on the book. But I, that's that's uh, in, in my thoughts. The bottom line is this. The seed war is real. Um, the, these entities can shapeshift. They can appear as whatever they want to. Their goal is to be worshipped. Their goal is to be worshipped. And this is another book which I started had three or four false starts on, not time to write it yet. But the idea that they do this on a global level, um, the case in point that we all know would be with Moshe. Why is it that when Moshe and Aaron come to Egypt, there's a full-blown occult paradigm in existence? Where does that come from? 
and, and the Egyptian magicians, we all know the story. They throw down their staffs and their staffs become serpents. Can you imagine in any hall of power today, right, where, where a bunch of people walked in and did something like that? You'd have people screaming and running out of the room. Nobody did anything. Oh, the magicians just went, oh, yeah, we can do that too. Bam. There's a full occult paradigm in operation, and that comes out of Hell's Kitchen. That They're all worshiping the serpent. They're all worshiping the serpent. That's why the serpent iconography is on a global level. We see it from the great serpent now here to everything in Egypt, to the headdresses that the pharaohs wore with, you know, the serpent on the... It's absolutely everywhere. And, you know, New Agers will go, serpent knowledge, you know, when this, the serpent denotes wisdom. Yeah, I get that. And you get wisdom, but where's that wisdom from? And it comes with a price, and that price is your soul. That's how you get the wisdom. Uh, I've talked to shamans... Uh, on the Navajo reservation, and they told me point blank that in order to get the power, you have to kill a family member. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's that's the last step. That's the last step. Mm. You have to kill a family member. Jeez. Ah. Well, when guys, I, hey. When, well, this, when I heard that, my I just chills up and down my spine. That's how serious it is, and that's why once they do that. They're imbued with that power, and it comes with a price, their own soul. But they can they can do stuff. Uh, Shape-shifting, uh, the ability to appear as, as a wolf man is a reality. That's not, you know, the gypsy woman with Lon Chaney. That's... Uh, oh, my God. You know, Ellie, I'll tell you what. That makes sense then. My stepdad was a Cherokee Indian. Uh, almost full-blooded and he tells me when he of course he passed on but he used to tell me the story of how he was walking one night and this is back when he lived up in the mountains there and he swears up and down he saw half man half wolf oh yeah, he did sure you know I had uh, it's, it's on the record in, in the book Nephilim hybrids uh, which is out of print because of the fire and I'm not sure what we're gonna do with that um, but uh, we lost all our inventory but uh, uh, Pastor Curtis was brought up on the Navajo Indian Reservation. He took me out to the site where he encountered this thing with two other boys, three other boys. And they heard this blood curling scream and they ran up to the top of this hill. And up, up this hill comes a man, except it's got a head of a wolf. And the, the, the hands were the arms of a man with the claws of a wolf. And from the knees down with the feet, of a wolf, and it was a wolf man, and they just were terrified and, and, and ran off. And then later on, his father had a call that one of the shamans was was given uh, uh, money to kill a family. And so he was there at the family, and they called his father. His father grabs his Bible, jumps in the pickup truck. His son now is 21, Pastor Kurtz Jr. They go flying off, and they get to the place where the house is, and he goes, where is it, where is it? He goes right at it, man, with, with the Bible. And the thing runs because greater is he that is in, you know, us than than what's what's manifesting. Yes. And Pastor Curtis Senior would take, you know, took no prisoners. This thing ran, ran. So it was, uh, you know, that's our authority as a believer. Amen. So all this stuff is real. Uh, the church doesn't teach it. The church is afraid of it. I mean, can you imagine if something like that happened, manifested in a church today, or or even someone who's demon possessed? And we've seen that. People don't know how to deal with it. No. And so most believers aren't, you know, uh, trained, and well, we need to train. And I've heard you mention this. I've taught on this before. And uh, and clearly, as Paul said, you, you fight against principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. This is not skim milk. You're not just dealing with anything. And, and I really... I've been praying about this, trying to find the mind of God to understand when Paul says, put on the full armor of God, I, I can't help but wonder if there's more to it than what he's saying. You know, the helmet of salvation. Uh, yeah. You know, Paul knew some things that were coming in our day, and I have a feeling there was probably more that he was dealing with them. Because, you know, LA, you're the you're the guy that knows this stuff. The technology and stuff that we have today comes from these entities to begin with. Well, if it comes from them then, and we see clearly in the hieroglyphics in Egypt, the, the technology they had back then, even Israel, the, the temple itself, the modern water system that was in the temple to bring the water up on the temple mount, and, and people saying, oh, that's not the real temple mount, that's the, that was the Roman fortress. Well, 
right here in Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, you can read here for yourself. Yeshua clearly identifies the Roman fortress on the Mount of Olives. Imagine that one. So there goes that theology. But uh, it's because people underestimate or under, they undermine the fact that the technology that they had to be able to do things back then as well. Uh, okay, yeah, they had mud houses instead of what we have today. But still, how do they move the stones? How do they end up... Uh, you know, putting water and, and with the seals, the pipes and stuff, just like what we have today. It's incredible. Yeah. So. So before I go, I just want to give a shout out to those um, who have helped us through the fire. We really appreciate it. And, and we thank you for it. And also, uh, here the Watchman is coming up in March. Uh, go to my blog, lamarzuli.wordpress.com. Lots of conferences. We just got, there's a new UFO conference in Arkansas uh, on April 18th. I'll be speaking at that. And of course, um, uh, Branson with Steve Quayle. We'll be talking about UFOs there with Tim Alberino, Richard Dolan, and some others for Steve Quayle's conference in September. So September, uh, okay. Check I was wondering about that one. Sounds great. Hey, thank you so much, LA, for coming on. We enjoyed having you. you. And uh, a lot of minds are being opened, and people are, are you know, you got to get ready, guys. It's not going to be good. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank Coming you, Ali. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks. Shalom, shalom, shalom to you guys.